Looks like the root altar. It is the root. I like this one a lot. This is in my personal collection home. Big Beat Heat. Alan Freed in the early years of rock and roll. It really gives a great account of the Alan Freed story. The disc jockey who started everything with rock and roll. It's funny how most of the time rock books are fairly cheap and affordable. You know? There's not a big... Well, uh, they are. And the thing is, uh, nowadays with eBay and Amazon.com, it's it's... It's fairly easy to get almost any title, but a lot of these rock and roll books just weren't very popular at the time they were released in the 60s and 70s, and they had a very short first printing. So there's not a lot of copies out there available. Right. And a lot of times, you know, titles you're looking for just don't show up on eBay or Amazon.com, so you have to resort to uh, used bookstores or record stores, and you never know what you're going to find. This is a very interesting title, The Age of Rock. So they have an excellent selection here of music books at Joe's Record Paradise, I can tell you that. Yeah, what, is there like a, diff, a book that you've been chasing, looking for, for a long time, or is there one that you've, uh, like a holy grail of rock books? Well, really, the one of the toughest books to find, it was an, an Alice Cooper, like, autobiography, which, you know, somebody else co-wrote it with him, it was called Me, Alice. And they've never reprinted that book, it was only printed in hardback. And uh, it goes for ridiculous prices on eBay. I mean, it's upwards of like five or six hundred dollars a copy, and that's that's one of the rarest rock and roll books in existence. Me, Alice, uh, by Alice Cooper. And that was published when? Uh, I believe it was sometime in the 70s, but it had a very short. It was a hardback and a very short run, wow. and not not a whole lot of copies were printed up, and consequently, it's worth a small fortune these days. Do you still have all your books, or are you, uh... No, I roll them over pretty quickly. I, I basically had a rule that you should never have more than 200 books in a collection, uh, because you're never going to read any more than that in your lifetime. Uh, so when I acquire a book, I read it cover to cover, but then it goes on the shelf, and uh, my collection really got out of hand pretty quickly, so I recycle them. Uh, after I read them, I extract the information I need uh, for my various writing projects, and then I either get them back to used bookstores or donate them to the PTA sale at the Greenbelt Labor Day Festival or something like that. But my collection today, I have a few sentimental items, uh, usually like biographies. Uh, I have a copy of Me, Alice, the Alice Cooper autobiography, and a few items like that. But most of what I have in my collection today is reference material. You know, books where they have lengthy passages that I'm going to refer to for various articles and books that I write in the future. And I try to keep, I think actually right now I'm carrying about 250 books in my collection, so I've broken my own rule. But 90% uh, of what I have in there, it's something that will be used in the future at some point. Yeah, I, I guess the thing is, um, do you get signed books or do you like... No. Uh... Uh, because again, if, if you go after a signed book, that means you're a collector and you're gonna be hanging on to it forever and ever. Then when you pass away, it goes to a family member or family members just put it in the trash. And I don't really have sentimental value for books. Uh, they, it's more functional. They have to serve a purpose. They have, there has to be material that I'm going to refer to in the future when I'm writing an article or a book myself. And it's usually titles you can't find at the local library. So that's kind of my collection has evolved. It used to be, hey, I really enjoy reading this book. Nowadays, it's what can I use from this book in the future? Of course, you have the poster of Danny Gatton, one of the greatest guitarists that uh, popular music has ever known. He uh, defied categorization, played every style. He was a master of every style, and uh, he was a local product, uh, born in Washington, D.C., and uh, actually uh, grew up in Southeast D.C. on Elmira Street and attended Blue High School for a year or two before transferring to Oxon Hill High School. He graduated from Oxon Hill in 1963, then lived in Akakeek for a number of years, and uh, basically played, uh, made his reputation playing around the Washington, D.C. area for decades. Then, of course, Link Ray. Uh, Link Ray and his Raymond, that's one of the great rock and roll albums ever recorded. Um, Link Ray was another product who, uh, he was born in North Carolina, but he came to Washington, D.C. in 1955 and lived in Southeast in an apartment on Orange Street. And uh, along with his brother Doug Ray on drums and Shorty Horton on bass, they were a trio known as Link Ray and the Raymen. And they played all over Washington, D.C. They had a number of other local musicians in and out of their band through time. Uh, you know, Bobby... Uh... Bitchin'. 
Bob Bitchin. No, uh, Bobby Howard was Bobby the lead. Howard, right. Bobby Howard was the lead singer for yeah. them for a while, and uh, they had some. Uh, Bill Hodge is a keyboard player, was in and out of the band. Uh, Elwood Brown was a bass player with them uh, in the late 60s. But they played uh, nightclubs like the 1023 in Southeast DC in the Beehive. And uh, they did a few things at the Shelter Room. And they played all over Washington DC at the Famous and uh, some of the places on 14th Street, Benny's Rebel Room. And uh, for a number of years, Link Ray was uh, the hot guitarist in town, certainly in the late 50s and throughout the 60s. Is the the Doyle brothers? Yeah, uh, the original Fetish. They were a band that was popular in the uh, the mid seventies. And Lewisdale of Lewisdale, Maryland. Lewisdale, Prince George's County. And I think a few of the guys are still uh, still milling about Lewisdale to this day. Oxy Scrub and uh, and uh, a couple others. What what are you uh, are working on? What do you want to talk about that you're working on right now? I have one main project, uh, which I started working on on April 1st, 2006. So it's approaching five years I've been working on this. It's an expanded, revised, updated history of popular music and rock and roll in the Washington, D.C. area. But it's really about how popular music arrived in D.C. in the 1800s and how it evolved through time, and then eventually how rock and roll emerged uh, in the early 1950s, and it covers every aspect of DC music, uh, from pop, folk, uh, what they called race music at the time, and how all of those styles developed within the city of Washington and the surrounding area, and how rock and roll eventually evolved from that when the nightclubs uh, started booking rock and roll in the early 1950s within Washington, DC. And uh, within that framework, I'm interviewing uh, many additional musicians, uh, music musicians who didn't get covered in the first versions of Capital Rock. I'm expanding on a lot of the musicians who were profiled in Capital Rock and it's uh, a very uh, sizable, uh, very detailed, uh, very in-depth and uh, very ambitious project and I'm hoping I can get it done within the next couple of years, but we'll see.